The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is one of my favourite three games of all time, and I've always wanted to make the grass effect in Unity. Now that we've seen some more details about the sequel, now's a great time to capitalise on the hype, write the YouTube algorithm, and get a shader video into everyone's feeds. Today, we're going to use some secret shader knowledge to make it using Universal Render Pipeline in Unity. This video is based heavily on the work of others, so their work will be cited in the description and throughout the video. We'll need to use shader code, but if you're used to shader graph, I'd still recommend coming along for the ride and checking out the product source on GitHub. And if you need a refresher on URP shaders, I've got a video on that exact topic. Breath of the Wild's grass effect can be made using geometry shaders. As opposed to a vertex shader, which just messes with vertices passed to it, a geometry shader can actually create new vertices. That's how we'll add the new blades of grass. We'll start off with an unlit shader file, but most of the boilerplate won't make the cut. We want to make our shader compatible with URP, and for that, I'll be following the steps from Cyan's URP shader tutorial. We need to include shader variables in the properties block and then again in HLSL code inside a special C buffer, and since there's a lot of these, I'll explain them as I use them throughout the video. We need to use content from URP's core and lighting shader files, so include those. And of course, we can't forget about the vertex input and vertex output structs, which will contain the vertex position, normal, tangent, and UVs. We'll write a super basic vertex shader, which just takes the data from vertex input and transforms the vertex position and UVs appropriately. Then create a pass and add a fragment shader which just outputs white and BAM! We have ourselves a skeleton shader to work from. We'll also turn cull off because we want both sides of our grass to get shown. From this point, the technique for creating the grass is heavily based on Roy Stan's fantastic article on the subject. It's one of the best game dev tutorials I've ever seen, so go give it a read after this video. As I mentioned, the geometry shader can add new vertices. It takes every vertex output by the vertex shader, and then using that as a basis, it can add new vertices of its own, and we're going to create a single triangle pointing upwards at every vertex as a starting point. Our geometry shader outputs slightly different data than the vertex shader, so we'll make a new struct called geomdata, which contains the vertex position and UVs, same as before, plus the world space position, which we don't need just yet, but we're sowing seeds for later. The geometry shader, a function called geom, will take just a single point or vertex and a triangle stream containing that geom data strut that we just made. Think of this as a big list of vertex data and we'll add to this throughout the geometry shader. We also need to specify the maximum number of vertices the geometry shader can output for every input vertex. We can start off with a max vertex count of 3, or 1 triangle. And now we'll add that triangle. I'll jump the gun a bit and create a function called transform geom to clip just above the geom function, because it'll save us some time later. This function will take a root position for the grass blade, and then it will let us add an offset with a transformation matrix applied to the offset. This will eventually let us rotate and bend the grass blades in all kinds of ways, and it's a convenient way of bundling everything up into creating a geom data instance so we can keep our code trimmed down. For this to work, we need to change our vertex shader so that it doesn't automatically apply the object space to clip space transformation. Instead, the position and normal need to be transformed from object to world space in the vertex shader. The new vertex shader will be called geomvert, and we can update the vertex shader declaration in the pass accordingly. Back in the geom function, we'll create a 3x3 identity matrix, and then make the three vertices using the transform geom to clip function that we just wrote. Each one is passed into a tristream.append, which adds them to that big list of vertex data I mentioned. Tristream.restart strip can be used to end this triangle strip and start a new one, but we'll always create exactly one strip, so this isn't really required. In the pass, we'll add hash pragma require geometry and hash pragma geometry geom to activate the geometry shader. Now let's see the geometry shader in action. 
Ogras looks almost exactly the same as Breath of the Wild. Okay, maybe not, there's still a lot to do. Now that we've got our geometry shader working and the grass blades spouting from each vertex of the plane mesh, let's breathe some life into them using colour. The transform geometry clip function did more than just set the position of each grass blade, it also set the UV coordinates for each vertex, and will use those to add much needed texture and a colour gradient. Breath of the Wild doesn't actually add much texture by the looks of it, so this is more like a stylistic choice by me. In the properties, I added a base colour and tip colour for the colour gradient and a blade texture to give each blade a bit of shading in the centre. In the fragment shader, it's just a couple of lines of code to interpolate between the base and tip colours, and multiply by the blade texture. And now our test scene suddenly looks like someone's left strings of pride bunting pointing skywards. Obviously we can't keep the grass looking this uniform, so let's add some code to rotate the grass. One of the problems we have right now is that we're defining the grass in local space, so if we rotate the plane, it looks like a fold up bungee pit. We want to define each blade in tangent space so that it points along the vertex normal vector, and then apply a transformation from tangent to local space. We can use the existing normal and tangent vectors to create a third vector called the bitangent vector, and then create a tangent to local transformation matrix using the three vectors. That also means that we need to change the vertical offsets to be on the z axis rather than the y axis. For the next part, we'll include two functions called rand for random number generation and angle axis 3x3 for building rotation matrices, as well as defining pi and 2pi. The grass blades will randomly rotate on the spot, so we can build a rotation matrix that spins around the normal vector by a random amount and then we'll build a second rotation matrix around the x-axis for the grass blades bending forwards and backwards. There's a bends delta property that I wrote for that. Only the tip vertex is influenced by the bend transformation, so we apply the transformations differently to each vertex accordingly. Now if we pan back out to the scene view, the blades are a bit more relaxed. They're just chilling in the sun. However, every blade is still the same shape. Like in nature, we want the grass to have some variation in height, thickness, and curvature. So far, we've stuck with only three vertices per grass blade, but this restricts the amount of shape we can give them. To add curvature, we'll need more vertices. We can define a number of blade segments at the top of the code and change the max vertex count to be that, times two, plus one. Now we're going to randomly pick the width and height between a range of possible values and add an additional bend amount, all of which is controlled by new properties. Instead of creating all the vertices manually, we'll create them in pairs inside a for loop and then set the tip vertex at the end. Every vertex beside the first two will use the transformation matrix we previously used for just the tip, and then we'll add curvature using a new property called blade bend curve. We can set as many blade segments as we want, and the loop does the math for us. Now we've got some lovely bent blades, but the shader still doesn't make the cut. I want to include something Roystan didn't in the original tutorial, and that's a way of mowing down some of the grass. It's common to pass all sorts of data to shaders through the use of extra texture maps, and we're going to use one to denote which areas of the plane should have grass and which shouldn't. We can read textures during the geometry stage if we use text2dLOD, which we'll do now to read the grass map property to get a visibility value. We just pick the highest quality LOD, or level of detail, by using a four element vector for the UVs and setting the fourth component to zero. It's a grayscale texture, where a value of 1 means grass should be present, and 0 means it's gone. We also have a grass threshold property. Visibility values above or equal this will result in grass being shown. We'll just wrap everything we've got so far in an if statement, and now we can selectively sow the grass where we want. We can add a fall off so the grass gets shorter at the edges too. Smooth step gives us a nice curve for that, and then we can just multiply the random weights used for the width and height. 
You could go one further and devise a method for cutting grass based on in-game actions, such as a green-clad hero hacking at foliage in search of currency. It'd usually involve drawing on the grass map in real time. People like Daniel Santala have put together great tutorials for doing something very similar with snow. And on the flip side, Minions Art has created a system for painting grass on a mesh. Both are great places to go after this video. Our grass has plenty of variation now, but it's still static, so let's add some atmosphere. I tried really hard to find out how to integrate our grass seamlessly with Unity's wind zones, but it turned out to be a bit of a forlorn attempt. Basically, wind zones are great for terrains and particles, but not so much for shaders. So I resorted to the same method as Roystan, we'll just use a texture to blow wind through the grass. This technique involves using a flow map and scrolling it over the grass over time, then converting the texture's colours to directions in which to bend the grass even more. Like before, we can sample the wind flow map using text 2D LOD after calculating the UVs. We'll use this to create another transformation matrix which gets supplied to everything apart from the base two vertices. If we chose to bend those two base vertices, then they could end up clipping through the floor, and that's a visual bug we don't want to take root. You'll need to tweak the values a lot based on the mesh and grass you're using, but this grass is starting to blow me away. I still wrote a little script that lets us set up a wind zone and use that to automatically update the wind velocity and frequency. It's really nothing special, but it means we can just update the wind zone and the direction and strength of the wind for every grass mesh will update automatically. And because of the way I programmed the shader, it'll look completely silly when you actually rotate during runtime. Oh well. You could fix it by calculating the time-based offsets in the script rather than the shader, but that wasn't really a focus for me. The individual grass blades are looking full of life now. I mean, if you were a bug, wouldn't you go for them? Problem is, the grass is a bit too spaced out. We're pretty much done with the geometry shader now, so how do we make the grass thicker? Well, we could use a mesh with more vertices, or we could make use of another kind of optional shader. Tessellation shaders can be used to subdivide a mesh so that it's made out of more primitive shapes, triangles in our case. Typically, this lets you generate highly detailed surfaces from lower poly meshes, and you can even generate LODs on the fly. But for a start, we're most interested in just adding vertices between each face of the mesh. The tessellation stage as a whole slots in between the vertex and geometry stages. Roystan's tutorial covers tessellation, which itself is based on Cat-like Coding's tutorial. That's linked in the description too, and it goes into far more detail than I will. Compared to geometry shaders, tessellation shaders are a bit more technical. For a start, in HLSL it's two shader functions called Hull and Domain. We'll start with the Hull shader. It's responsible for taking an input patch of vertex data and creating new control points, which are basically new vertices in the tessellated mesh. We need to define a few things about the function, but probably the most important part is the patch constant function. That's another function that we need to write separately. The hull shader function itself just returns a control point. The patch constant function is where we write the logic that determines exactly how the new vertices are created, and I like to think of it as part of the hull shader. We're going to create new vertices along each edge, and also in the centre of the triangle in layers. A new struct called tessellation factors contains that data. In our case, we want to be able to define a distance between the grass blades in the inspector and let the tessellation system work out the right number of vertices. We'll write another function, yes I know we're swimming in the middle of stage, called tessellation edge factor, and use this to calculate the number of new vertices on each edge. The number of inside layers can just be the mean average of those three edge values. The tessellation edge factor function is pretty simple. We'll take the length of the edge and divide by a property called tessellation grass distance. By doing it this way, the density of grass is independent of the mesh used. Once we've done that and assembled all these bits of code in the right order, all we're left with is the domain shader. Thankfully the domain shader is a bit simpler. 
It takes the new vertices that were generated after the whole shader and is responsible for interpolating the properties of the old vertices onto the new ones. These fancy sounding barycentric coordinates are just a way to express the new vertices as a weighted sum of the old ones. So if we take the respective properties of the old vertices and multiply by the barycentric coordinates, we'll get the right values of the properties for the new vertices. We'll use a macro to do this for each property rather than rewriting the logic for each one. And to make our lives easier, we'll use a new vertex shader called testvert, which just transforms a vertex input into a vertex output without changing anything. Remember that our geometry shader needs a vertex output. That's why we do this conversion here. But there's one kind of shader that we've barely touched on, and it's the good old fashioned fragment shader. We've got a pretty comprehensive grass setup already, but in the final step, we're gonna make our grass able to receive shadows. The last step comes to us courtesy of Ben Golas on the Unity forums. If you've ever posted a technical graphics question and got a good answer, it was probably from him. In our fragment shader, we're already using the grass blade texture as a sort of grayscale shading map, so all we need to do is multiply this by the lighting amount. Unity provides a couple of functions to help us calculate the lighting here. Get shadow coord and main light real time shadow together gets us the level of light between 0 and 1 falling on this pixel. And I'll add an offset of 0.25 to simulate ambient light. That's actually all there is to it. As homework, you could also try making the grass cast shadows too. Roysan's tutorial does this, and Cyan's URP guide has some great content on writing a shadow caster pass, so those would be a great place to start. Let's take a last look at our new grass. Grass is a fantastic tool to add detail to your scenes, especially in an open world setting where it can help break up large bland sections of ground. We learned a lot today, including two totally different kinds of shader, and we saw how we can upgrade content written for Unity's built-in pipeline to Universal Render Pipeline. Thanks to all my Patreon supporters on screen right now. It's been a while since the last video, but with your support, I'll be able to get more videos out. I have a whole bunch of ideas, but currently I'm gravitating towards making a cell shading tutorial in the vein of a little known game called Breath of the Wild, plus more Unity Basics videos. Let me know what you want me to cover in the comments. Remember to subscribe and thanks for watching.